right, so in the session today, we're going to be looking at building your IELTS teaching mindset and mastering the band descriptors. Now, we were planning to look at speaking and writing, but um, I don't know if we'll have enough time. So no we might just look at writing today and then we might look at speaking um, in the next session as well. But I think I think we should be good. So anyway, let's get started. Um, what are we going to cover today? So we'll start off, you know, thinking about your your kind of mindset. Um, why do I want to teach IELTS? Um, who am I as a teacher and who, I, who do I want to be? Um, what is an ideal IELTS student? Why should they work with me? We'll look at imposter syndrome as well, because um, this is something pretty major. We'll look at the band descriptors, and then we have some course updates and a Q&A at the end. So pretty standard, but we'll go over everything with you on here. Um, so we'll think a little bit about mindset. So um, actually, I've just, yeah, we were, I was chatting to John just a few minutes ago. We were talking a little bit about this, so... I think we'll go a little bit deeper um, into this when we think about mindset um, as IELTS teachers. So um, why do I want to teach IELTS? Claudia, what are some reasons why we want to teach IELTS? What are the reasons why we think this is a good idea for us to teach? Yeah, so of course, there's a high demand for IELTS. Um, and people, the thing is, IELTS has been around for a very long time as well. So that's where it feels secure. Um, also, IELTS expires uh, every two years. So depending on the student's um, visa, they might even come back to you as well. So there's just, there's this endless demand. Um, you can definitely, and you should charge higher for an IELTS lesson um, compared to a general English lesson. Um, and then for me personally, I just like the fact that it's results driven. Um, you are working towards a very clear goal and you're working towards those results. So, so either your student gets the score or they don't. And if they do, it's a big deal. Um, so they get to go to their dream university. They get to move abroad and basically start a new life, essentially. And you get to be a part of that, which is also quite rewarding. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. You know, we, you know, I've, I talk to teachers all the time. And even today, we, we had this discussion about I need to build up, you know, something that's going to be secure, build a foundation, go beyond just general one to one teaching or general, you know, general English teaching. So why do we want to teach IELTS? All these, th these things are possible, high demand, higher pay, more flexibility, hopefully ways to build your skills and knowledge and have that security and have that foundation. So this is really important. Um, and I wanted to touch on this because, um, you know, we've got to think about these things about where I want to be. I'm not going to read all of this, but um, just to kind of help us with, with where we are and where we want to be. You know, first of all, what are our, our core values as a teacher? Who are we? What's our identity? Because this is what's going to be communicated to potential students or potential groups of students. What are their goals? Generally speaking, scoring a seven, Plus, that is the general goal um, for most students. Maybe it's a six, maybe it's a bit more, but generally seven plus. Um, what strategies are most effective? So what can you leverage? What knowledge or what skills can you leverage to help you to meet the needs of these students? Um, what are my strengths and weaknesses? You know, we, we've been doing this for a long time. I know a lot of you have been teaching for a long time as well. We have to be reflective. We have to think, OK, this is what I'm really good at. So I'm really good at speaking skills. So perhaps I'm going to focus more on speaking than writing. or on the flip side, I'm good at both. I can teach both well, but I still need to know more about, you know, the band descriptors or the process or how I'm going to market myself or how I'm going to sell my programs, et cetera. Um, philosophy. Are you more about the nuts and bolts, you know, really focusing on the skills? Are you more about the personal approach with how you communicate with students? Um, and how do I want my students to describe me as a teacher? I'm asking these questions and these questions are here because when you're having conversations with students, with parents, with groups of students, if you can communicate to them that you're knowledgeable, reliable, you've got the experience and you get results, that is going to make the process so much easier for you, as opposed to just saying, I'm Daniel and I teach IELTS. Fantastic. So does everyone else. What's the difference? So we've got to think about how we, you know, project ourselves and how we think about this um, as well. So um, many teachers who want to become IELTS teachers, they're not familiar with the exam format. We know this. This is something we're going to go through. Um, they need specialized training, which we've covered. 
Students have high expectations and high values. So if they're investing in you as a teacher, they need to know that they're going to get the results. You can't guarantee, you can't promise those results. But if you have a system and you have a way of going through the process with them, you have the curriculum, you have the materials, you have the knowledge, then you can help them provide those results. Um, the changes, things change all the time. So can we keep up with those changes? There's computer-based testing now. There is one skill resets now. There's lots of different ways to take the test. So if you can help them through that journey, then again, that's going to be a, a real benefit for you. Um, the biggest thing, though, is where do I find students? And as a teacher, where do I go to get students? How can I you know, seek them out and present them a Grand Slam, like present them an amazing course, a program that's going to help them get the results they need and build the client base? So these are all the things you need to think about. But these are the things that we can help you with. So um, why is an IELTS student ideal for me? Why an IELTS student as opposed to a general English student, Claudia? Yeah, well, the thing with the IELTS students is that they come with motivation. You won't need to work too hard to keep them motivated because um, they need to get their visa. They need this. Um, and so that's the great part about working with an IELTS student is that they already come to you very motivated um, and you need them to be motivated. Um, so, of course, I'm speaking generally here, uh, but you also need them to engage. So they need to be participating in your lessons. They need to ask questions. They need to be open to feedback and constructive criticism. Um, and generally, they they need to be making progress. So slowly, slowly, you need to see that progress. Um, and a big thing is that they need to take responsibility for their learning. Um, so they need to go away and practice on their own. A big part of IELTS preparation is practicing on your own. So you give them the strategies, but they have to apply them. Um, and to be honest with you, I've most of my IELTS students have been this way. Um, I would say one of the most challenging things you may face is maybe a student who isn't open to feedback. So this may be a student who has read so much information online and they've watched YouTube videos. And then when you do give them feedback, they might challenge it a little bit because of everything that they've read. And that's one of one of the things that that we deal with. And, and how do you deal with that? Right. To think about moving away from general to more focused and IELTS students in particular, you're going to get that upgrade. Um, again, you're going to charge more because you're going to offer more. And in kind, in as a result, those students should hopefully give you more as well. Um, so this actually ties into the last point of, of budget as well. Generally, most students, they do have a bit of a you know a higher budget they have a bit more to spend but when we get into the curriculum and program planning part we can talk about different options that we can can offer for students so that we can help them to be successful even if um they don't have as high a budget but generally speaking they do have a higher budget they're better motivated better engaged and they expect more from you so therefore you provide more for them so this is some things to think about starting out in your mindset in your approach to this all right let me move on here um so why should students work with me? Okay, so I'm an IELTS teacher now. I've just started teaching IELTS or I want to, you know, take this more seriously as a business or as a, you know, as a something I do as my main job. So why should they work with me? How am I going to, you know, position myself and how am I going to communicate what I offer to potential students? So essentially you can offer them what they need. So familiarity with the test format. Um, you can help them with their language proficiency. You can give them personalized attention, targeted practice, motivation, and accountability. So when we say about the test format, Claudia, the biggest problem we find is that students, they don't really know the test format, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All the band descriptors. Yeah. This is why we're going to focus on band descriptors today, especially for writing. Um, language proficiency. Uh, again, I just had this conversation earlier with 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 uh, with one of the teachers that we work with, who said students come to me and say, "Yeah, my English is actually really good. I just need a seven, so I don't need much. Like one or two classes, I'll be fine." And we know that's not the case as well, right? It's it's not yeah. necessarily the case. Um, you need to be able to help them identify, assess, and then present 
a solution for that problem for sure. Um, personalized attention as well. So they need to get feedback. They need to get the right feedback. They need to get good feedback based on the band descriptor. So this is what we'll talk about a little bit more as well. And targeted practice. What do we mean when we say targeted practice, Claudia? Yeah, so what are they struggling with? Because there are parts of the test where they may be stronger and other parts where they are weaker. And that's what we mean. So we need to identify their uh, personal weaknesses and help them improve that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then motivation and accountability. This is the most important thing, because if we look what's out there for most students, it is an online course. Great. Do I get to meet with the teachers? No. You might have a chat with them once in a while. Do I get that specific feedback? No. Okay, I'm probably going to give up. I'm just going to keep failing or keep going around in circles or finding everything and not finding something that works. So if you can provide that motivation and accountability and, you know, help them prepare, go through the steps, go through the process with them, that is going to be the difference in helping them achieve their target score as opposed to giving up and forgetting about it. So think about as your mindset, I can do this, I can provide these things, I can give the support that students need so that they can be successful. And that will help you on your journey to building this business and building your, um, your foundation for IELTS teaching. Um, so imposter syndrome. Um, I have felt this a lot as a teacher. Have you also felt this, Claudia? Yeah, many and times. <laughs> what, what are some of the things of imposter syndrome? Like what are some, some things that come up that we think about? I think the big one is just, you know, can I do this and what qualifies me to do this? I think that's yes. a big one. So many teachers say, well, it's it's such a big exam and I don't think that I can learn the exam. I don't think I can do it. But um, that that's a lie. You can. And just like, you know, we as teachers, we have to dispel um, the myths and the lies that our students believe about their language and about their capabilities we have to do the same for ourselves or maybe we need other people to do the same for us. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, just being in a, in a community helps you because what lies are you telling yourself about your capabilities and, and what is the truth actually? Right. As, as teachers, when we meet students, we meet students who say, I can't do this. It's impossible. I'm never going to be able to, to, to improve. And yeah, what happens? They work through the process. They work through the steps. They improve. Mm -hmm. As teachers, it's the same. I didn't think, you know, six years ago when I started examining that, you know, that I would understand it and be, you know, proficient and and know how everything works inside out. I thought IELTS examining is very, very difficult. I'm not sure if I'm ever going to get this, but I did. And I got through it and I learned the steps and I practiced and I became more competent and more confident. So you might compare yourself with other people you see online, people who have like, you know, followings of hundreds of thousands and millions and think I can never do this. Well, Yes, you can. And just because someone else is doing better than you doesn't mean that you cannot succeed because there's place, place there's spaces for everyone. And honestly, there's millions of tests that are taken every year. Like you can definitely be a part of that for sure. You might feel that you're not good enough or prepared enough. Well, that's fine. Get support, get help, get guidance, go through this, take some time to invest in this. If you can increase your hourly rate from $20 an hour to $50 an hour, then it is worth putting in a little bit of time or a little bit of investment to make that change. Um, you might have received negative feedback from students or colleagues. This is something that, that definitely discourages people. They feel like, well, this person said this or this student said this, so I'm not good. Well, you're not defined by one person or one student, um, you know, there definitely are things you can learn and I've made mistakes. I don't get everything right. And if I, if I find that I do make a mistake, I will ask, you know, okay, how can I improve next time? I'll ask myself and I'll reflect on that and I'll go through the process. And this is what we can help you with as well. Um, you might be perfectionist. Um, I know most teachers, including myself, we are perfectionists. We spend hours perfecting things, putting things together and it doesn't work or it goes wrong. And we feel like, oh my God, I'm a failure. I can't do this. And we give up, but please don't because we can help you and we can help each other as well. So how can we overcome this imposter syndrome, Claudia? What are the things that we can, we can offer? Yeah. So like I said, community is really important. Being around people who can um, kind of just call out the things in you that you don't see yourself. Yeah. Um, we're all different as teachers and we, 
we all have different teaching styles and, and we're stronger in some areas or, and it's just nice to have that recognized. And sometimes you can't recognize certain skills that you have, or even just the way that you deal with the student and handle the student, encourage a student. Mm-hmm. Those things are big, you know? Yes. Um, so I think that's the first thing is just being around community that can help you possibly coaching as well. Um, and then recognize and celebrate your successes. So even the small ones, the big ones, look at what you've done that you're proud of. Mm-hmm. Um, focus on, as Daniel said, just learning all the time and developing what you don't have or, you know, any of your weak points. We're always improving. We can always improve. So develop those areas. And then the the growth mindset that we always hear about nowadays I think we hear about this because it's so important you know is failure feedback or is failure the end of the road for me Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. those are some of the things you need to um, kind of confront yes and starting this journey starting a business or starting to get students on your own is scary it's daunting you don't have those supports in place so this is why if you think about this whole approach we'll go through the steps like today we're going to look at the writing band descriptors okay i'm more comfortable with writing now i can go over writing i can be comfortable in applying it and going through the skills and working with a student so we're going to put these things in place to hopefully help you do that and support you with that as well and you know the best feedback you can get is when a student comes to you and says hey daniel thank you with your help i got my score i'm able to move to this country or study at this university or, or whatever it is that's your proof that you're doing a great job and you will get those successes for sure if you follow through the steps so this is and this is the way to help build your business it might take three six nine twelve months to get started but guess what as soon as you have that first student and you're working with them then you've already done the hardest part and that's what we'll get to all right um band descriptors let's get into it um we have a bit of time. I don't know if we have enough time, but we'll try our best to go through it with you. Um, because what we want to look at is writing specifically, because this has been identified by you um, as a major area where we find it difficult to differentiate and distinguish. Okay, well, what is a six? What is a seven? What is an eight? Why can't students get above 6.5? IELTS must be a scam. There must be something examiners do deliberately to make more money. No, but this is what we hear. So let's go through it. Let's break it down and let's try to show you the different steps. And this is just kind of going to be, you know, a crash course, a starting point. We'll go into this further, but we want to just talk to you about the elements here. So writing task one. So let's start off with the first task and let's really drill down into this, because as previously mentioned, as examiners, this is the only way we can assess candidates writing performance. Okay, Um, and this is a really important thing as well. Task one is worth about roughly one third, 33.3. I can't put the three recurring or it would take up the whole slide. Task two, 66%. Um, In your course, if you signed up to the course, you do have copies of these. So you can download these and keep these and start to look at them. How do I really understand the language? What does it actually mean? How does it actually translate to an exam and to a response? So download a copy, please save it and study it. We're going to refer to this a lot. This is your roadmap. This is your Bible. We'll start with this on here. Now, Claudia, for you, when you first looked at this, you know, these band descriptors, how did you start to make sense of them? Did it take a long time? It did take a while, actually, because I didn't have community like this. So, and I don't, I don't think many teachers, um, any IELTS teachers that have been teaching for a while, um, there were no courses at the time. Six years ago, there was just nothing. Um, so yeah, just looking at this, I what I did was, of course, read it really carefully and break it down and try and understand, okay, well, what does task response even mean? Oh, that means did, how well did my student answer the question? Um, coherency and cohesion. Does it make sense? Are they using transition words? Is it logical? Um, Lexical resources, vocabulary, what kind of vocabulary are they using? You know, this sounds um, simple, but are they using good, 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 good in everything in an an essay? It's not good enough. Um, And then grammatical range and accuracy. So a range of grammatical structures, as well as those complex sentences. What does that mean for my students? 
Um, and how can I do this in a way that's not overwhelming to them as well? Yes. And one thing to look at when you first look at this, it looks a bit daunting, like, oh my God, there's all these levels, there's yeah. all this information. To be honest, you're only going to be working with a sliver, sliver of it or a slither of it or a short part of it. Because once you assess your student's level, if they're at a five, okay, we'll need to get up to six, maybe a seven. So we're just going to focus on those parts of it. So again, do take time to look at it in its entirety so you can understand the differences. And then once you've assessed your student's level, then you can start to work through the levels and start, if they start at a five, you can work up to a six and a seven. Now, task one does not get enough attention. Examiners comment that part one, task one writing is the biggest reason students perform poorly in the writing test because they don't take time to really focus on part one, task one. And as a result of that, they get a poor score and task two might be really well done, but 33% of it's already fallen down. So it's, again, they're limiting themselves quite a lot by performing poor, poorly in the first part. What are some of the reasons that students don't perform very well in task one, Claudia? Yeah, so like you said, they they may not take it seriously, um, especially mm -hmm. in the general exam, because the gen general and academic, those two tests are different, especially when it, well, when it comes to writing. Um, so task one is the main difference. Um, and in general, you just have a letter. So students think, well, I can write a letter. That's fine. You know, 150 words. I'm good. It's okay. And they, they might even say to you, okay, we're done with that. I need to get to the essay. The essay is what I'm stressing about the essay. And so they neglect task one. And, um, and that's that's a problem. Um, and then if we look at these over here, we can see understanding the question. Do they understand the difference between an informal and formal letter? Do they understand um, how to use data comparative language? Um, time management? Can Do they have time to plan, write, and then edit as well? Uh, we find that students try and write more than they need and they put themselves under unnecessary pressure. So that could also be a reason why they're struggling. Vocabulary, they may not be using um, advanced vocabulary. So these are not like fancy words to try and impress anyone, but how can they express their ideas in a way that is natural and complex. If you're discussing complex ideas, you naturally need to use advanced vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, and then grammar, what kind of grammar are they using? Um, so this could be a struggle for task yes. one, for the letter yes. and, the, and the graph. Exactly, yeah. So they do vary. Um, so if you're not too familiar with, with um, the test as a general test and academic test, so the task is slightly different for task one for the writing, but for task two, it's the same. But with the question, um, again, not understanding the question, that's going to reduce the task response. So 25% of that is going to be affected. Time management, okay, I wrote too much. It's only 150 words, or I wrote too little. If I don't get that right, that's going to affect coherence and cohesion. So that's another 25% affected. Vocabulary, not using the right words. Again, that brings that down. Grammar, sentence structure, not structuring it properly. So remember, those different descriptors are all worth 25%. 25, 25, 25, and then it's 33% overall for task one, 66 for task two. So if when if we're getting these basic fundamental things wrong and we're not set up properly, then everything else is going to fall down. So the way that we teach writing is to use not, not a, a script as such, because that doesn't work, that's not natural, but a formula, a way they can approach it so that the idea is clear, the idea is organized. I'm using simple, clear language. And I'm making sure that my structures are clear and I avoid grammatical mistakes as much as possible. So that 50 to 75% of it is covered as best as possible. And the 25% just comes down to the ideas, the grammar, a few little mistakes. But that way, we're eliminating a lot of risk, a lot of potential to do poorly here. So the good news is that you can help students with these problems. Um, we can help you with this. We can talk about strategies and, and ways that we can teach task one. So big issue something that really needs focus. So please do focus on this and we will focus on this as well with you. So let's compare. Here is a typical band five um, response um, for part one, task one. Um, so as you can see, it's got three sections, three, not really paragraphs, but three sections. And again, I'm not gonna read it all, but you can just see in here, 
looks fairly simple, fairly straightforward. Now, the band descriptors are down here. So generally addresses the task, the format being maybe inappropriate in places, um, no clear overview, not really, no data to support the description, okay, presents but inadequately covers key features. So you might argue that it actually does meet some of this and goes beyond it, but in the other sections, does it do so? So you can see here, presents information with some organization, there may be a lack of overall progression. Okay, so again, does it progress, does it develop from simple to more specific? makes inadequate, inaccurate, or overuse of cohesive devices. Okay, in here, there's not really much. It's just as can be seen and overall. So maybe a little bit repetitive, perhaps. Limited range of vocabulary. So again, simple, clear, it's okay, but could be a little bit more developed. Um, might make some errors in spelling and or word formation. There's actually not many errors here, but the language isn't great. It's fairly basic. And then the structures, limited range of structures, attempts, complex sentences, may make frequent grammatical errors. So these are the different factors here when we look at it. Now, this would receive a band five because it meets the requirements, but falls short in vocabulary and grammar. Um, so the response doesn't provide an overview, not really. It says what it is, but it doesn't go into full detail. Um, and it's quite basic and repetitive. So it's quite limited in terms of that. So it might look fine at a glance, but when we really dig down, it might not be the level that's needed. So students might be writing at this level and think, oh, it's great. There's no mistakes. There's no errors. That's not, that's only part of the puzzle. So let's compare it. Um, so if we go here, okay, this is a band seven. What are the main differences here, Claudia? Yeah, so as you can see, it's more detailed. Immediately, you can look at that and see that it is more detailed. And so what they've done here is they've basically um, describe the trends a little bit more. It's almost like in an essay when you develop your ideas a little bit more. Um, and the language that they've used, uh, if you look at paragraph three or section three, one notable trend, that makes a difference instead of just saying one trend, one notable trend, because that's data language. Um, a sharp contrast between the UK and the USA. Once again, that's language that they need to use to in you know to analyze uh, data and so that's really important is okay what kind of language do they need to use for this task um so if we look at the side over here where it says why is it a band seven besides the fact that it's more detailed um the coherence and cohesion yeah because of those transition words um you can see at the beginning um, like I said, one notable trend. They're saying, on the other hand, one on one hand, on the other hand. Um, and the response not only provides a clear overview of the graph, but also prevent, uh, presents this detailed information that I'm talking about. And it's, um, it describes the trends accurately as well, mm -hmm. which yes. is really important. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, this is a big difference here, as you can see, and it's developed. It starts off, here's what it is specifically, and it goes into the specifics over the course of three years. So it's talking about a trend, it's developing. The other one's just very sim simplistic, sim simplistic, it's just saying what it is. Here it's actually saying, well, here's what it is, and, and here's what happened, and here's where it is, and here's where it went to, and this is the, the differences that were noted, and we've used in both Western countries here, so they've actually identified and picked out specific information as well, um, and they've used half instead of just 50%. They've tried to use different language and different structures. So again, here's an example. Now, interesting, the question is not here. Do I need the question to know what score it is? Well, yes, obviously that helps. But generally, as examiners, we can look at this and, and kind of have an idea before really even looking at the question. Um, but what's important to think about at this stage is what's the structure? What's a nice formula that I can give to a student so that they feel confident and prepared? So if they say, I don't know what to write for this question. I don't know what to say. Well, here's some things that we can plug in. We can give some chunks or some different ingredients to get started and you just need to put it all together like we're going to give you like the lego pieces and we're going to color code it for you and you're just going to kind of match it up now we don't want to teach memorization we don't want to teach this this process of memorizing answers but we do want to try to give strategies and solutions so that there's easy ways for students to just kind of 
plug in and have a structure. Okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do four, four sections. I'm going to talk about this. Then I'm going to say this. I'm going to use this. I know some language that I can use to plug in for each part of it. I know how I'm going to end it so I can I can start to put it all together like that. Now, this is really difficult. And the majority, if we look at the data, the majority of students really struggle to get to band seven because look at this. This is not easy to write, um, which begs the question, what is the band eight or band nine? But we'll just do one step at a time for today. Mm -hmm. But again, you can see the differences. It's just a very basic example and we will cover this more, but we just want to give you an overview um, of the band descriptors and how they work. So that is band, sorry, that is task one. Let's look at task two. So big difference here, big issues with task two. This is a response based on a prompt or an argument on a topic. Um, the biggest issues that students face can include time management, again, 40 minutes. So they actually have an hour to do this, the writing test of two tasks. Some of them spend too much time on this. They don't have any time for task one, 33% gone. So we need to make sure we're, we're giving enough time to each and we have a plan for that. We've got to plan, write and edit. That can take a while. They struggle. You know, let's do a struggle with this. So they don't have enough time to edit. So it affects their score. They have errors. They have issues, which brings it down. Understanding the question again, task achievement is worth 25%. If you do not understand the question, how are you going to be able to address it? Well, really simple. We can work with students to help them with understanding the question and making sure they know exactly what they're going to say. Developing ideas as well. We can use structures for this. We have structures that we use with our students um, that can just clearly lay out a response and they would just plug in the ideas given or their thoughts based on the prompt. Coherence and cohesion. Again, clear, concise paragraphs and sentences that link together seamlessly. Sounds difficult. They might struggle with this, leading to poor essays. So with coherence, again, we can keep it simple to start. Firstly, secondly, thirdly. Um, on one hand, on the other hand, overall in conclusion. So we can start off with those basic structures. And then once students get confident at the structure, we can then start to gently implement some other ways that they can start to use language more flexibly. Um, and again, grammar and vocabulary, huge issues, especially if someone's handwriting. Um, not that many students do that now. It's still the most popular option, but a lot of students are opting for computer-based, which is a little bit different. And we'll cover that as well in future sessions. But essentially with this is, you know, grammar and vocabulary. Those are the biggest reasons that students lose that 50% of, of the, the task two. Um, so that leads to a lower score as well. So all these things in totality look like huge problems. But if we just break it down and go through the process step by step with a student, we can help them to be successful in each part, in each task. And we have materials and resources and videos as well that can help you with that. So um, let's look then. Here's a band seven response for task two, Claudia. So how would we break this down and discuss this one? Yeah. So if we look at this, you can see um, that it does address all parts of the task prompt clearly and concisely, which is what they're asking for in the band descriptors. They do have an introduction and it does give us an overview of two sides of the argument and they state their opinion, which is important. Um, the body paragraphs provide specific supporting points. So they back up their topic sentences. They back it up with evidence. Um, and they have, they've used transition words, linking words, so that it's coherent and their cohesion score um, is a seven. Um, and then this is important. The writer's opinion, as I've mentioned, is clearly stated. That's mm -hmm. actually a really important part of the essay. Um, it's stated in the conclusion. So yes. they don't talk about their opinion too much in the body, but they're in their introduction and then in their conclusion, they, they basically tell you what their opinion is. And this is the band seven. And this looks impossible. It looks very difficult to achieve, but mm -hmm. honestly, it's very simple. So in the, in the introduction, we have two sentences. Okay. Most students can write two sentences for an introduction. So uh, three sentences, yeah, three short sentences on one hand. Okay. So they give their point. They explain the point. On the other hand, again, they give their point. They explain the point. In my opinion, 
and then they just they're just going to rephrase or paraphrase what they've already said in the previous sections and then give their final thought their final comment so we can work with students and in 10 11 sentences we can help them structure a really you know effective task two which is going to help them achieve that band seven that they need um, the problem is, is that a lot of students, they want to say too much. They want to go off task. They want to try to say more than is necessary. This, this task asks for 250 words, only 250 words. So why write three, four, 450 words? We don't need to, but this happens a lot. Why? Because students think they want to impress, want to, you know, use all this, you know, really high level, um, vocabulary that they don't need to use. Um, and they can just keep it simple. Again, this is not easy. This takes time to structure with a student, but once they go through those steps and once they go through, you know, the, the planning and they go through the ways to do this, then they can be successful. And this is the way to do it without overcomplicating and going over, you know, lots and lots of things. So let's move on. Um, let's compare. So this is band seven. Let's have a look at band nine. So this is a band nine response. Um, wow. Now, mm -hmm. Claudia, can most people do this? What would you say? Most students achieve a band nine, would you say? I mean, that is really difficult for a student to achieve a band nine. Um, really, really difficult. And some of them try and go for that. It's not necessary if they don't need that, though. So, you know, why even put yourself under that pressure? It's they're already under so much pressure. Yes. That's a great point. Um, right. And again, we got to think here with band nine. Why do some, some students I've met, they say, I want to get a band nine. And I'll try to say to them, that's not really possible for most native speakers, you know, like we yep. said. Um, yeah. So why would we need to reach for this? Now, this is, you know, this is probably writing at a master's or even a PhD level. Like most average native speakers would really struggle to do this. Um, it took me two tries to get this, but I was able to do it on my second try to get a band nine, but it was really tough. Why? Because we have to be pretty much flawless. And mm -hmm. you could show this to a student as this is a band nine and they would be very intimidated, but they look at these model answers. So students look, they search out, they seek out these model answers for band nine. They think, oh my God, I can never write at this level. Well, if they don't need to write at this level, then they don't need to worry about this. We can work mm -hmm. from the level that they're at. So if they're at a band five, they need a band six. We can look at that. Here's, here's where you're at. Here's a band five response. Let's look at a band six response. Let's look at the differences and let's work towards that. Okay, once we've got six safely managed, navigated, let's go to band seven. Let's see if we can manage that. And let's see if we can go up to that. So this is a band nine response. This would really be tricky to achieve as we know. So use this absolutely as a, as a, a, a kind of a, like how can I say this put this on a pedestal of like this is the ultimate and most people cannot do this but we don't need to do this we only need a seven so let's look at a seven and let's work at that you're at a six you're at a five right now let's work at that level so work at the level the students are at and kind of try to try to ask them not to worry about trying to achieve mm. this score because it's not realistic for most of us and the percentage of people who get a band nine is you know way way like we're talking tenths of percentage here. So again, this is not realistic. This is not possible. So band seven, definitely we can work towards this. So let's work at that level and work for what they need. Don't go above that. Um, but if you as, a, as an examiner or, you know, as someone who wants to examine or teach IELTS or build your business, if you want to practice, feel free to do this. Um, we have a tool we're going to share with you called Write and Improve. And you can try to try to model this and go through the process, because by going through this process yourself, you can see what it's like for the student, where they might have difficulties. And you can use that as a learning point as well. Um, yeah. So got a few questions here as well. Um, does giving one's opinion depend on the prompt or is it that generalized? And should it always be in the last paragraph? Good question. So let me go back to the band seven just for a moment, because it's important to address this now. So opinion will depend. There's not really such thing as a right or wrong opinion, as long as they support and develop that opinion sufficiently. Um, but you should always state ultimately what your opinion is in the last paragraph. Yes, it should be at the end, because if I say right at the beginning, my opinion is da -da -da -da, then it kind of negates the rest of the response. So 
we need to again like we do need to look at the issue and we do need to try to talk about both sides here because we're discussing it and then at the end we can give our final opinion so that's probably the best way to tackle it and that's what i um work with with students we try to go that way we try to say keep it keep it kind of general and then get more and more specific and then ultimately what's your ultimate opinion based on what you've said um Another question here, shouldn't giving opinion depend on the types of essay? For example, opinion type, agree, disagree. The opinion depend on types of essay. Well, if it asks you for an opinion, then absolutely. But the majority of the time, you will still need to compare one thing yeah. or the other thing or talk about one side or the other side. So it's um, maybe not necessarily opinion, but it would necessarily be looking at both sides or thinking about different um, perspectives on a point for sure. So the tools, like the methods will be the same. It's just changing mm -hmm. the word opinion for side one, side two, or perspective one, perspective two. Yeah. You have anything to add on this? Disadvantages. Yeah. Even with the advantage and disadvantage essay, students can give their opinion. So what side do they lean towards? Exactly. Um, what do they believe about, about that? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Great. So yeah, again, I, I know you might have more questions and that's fine. Please feel free to ask them. Um, we will cover this in a lot more depth. We're just kind of going over the, the basics today just to help you get a good understanding of it. Um, so let's let's think about this. Let's kind of put this together. So how can I accurately assess students' writing? So use um, IELTS band descriptors. So those band descriptors that we've provided, if you have access to the course, if you're a member, go in there and download them study them, make sure that you have a really clear picture of them and how you're going to look at the band descriptors for that student, for that level. So focus just on that level that they're at right now and maybe the next level up. That would be a good starting point instead of looking at this in entirety and getting overwhelmed and students would do the same. Um, yeah. So make sure you're familiar with the test structure, task types and time limits. Um, so again, think about how best the student can manage their time and how best they can navigate the structure as well. Know how the test is scored and the differences between them. So I've, I've shown you 33, 66, and then each um, answer, 25% per response for each element of the writing. Sample essays and model answers. So use sample essays and model answers at that level the student is at to see this is where you're at now, this is where you need to go to, and work your way up. Don't say, here's a band nine, because you're asking them to do somersaults when they can barely walk. So Take your time with that and work at that level. Really important. Um, and give good feedback as well. Like the feedback is really important. We're going to have a session on feedback where we're going to show you how to give specific feedback based on the band descriptors, based on the quantity of errors, based on the types of errors so that they can focus on those things if they need to, to improve their general English because they are related. Um, you can also make some sample essays and use sample essays as well to illustrate good techniques. So here's an essay that's used really good linking and connecting language. Here's mm -hmm. an essay that has a really good structure. So you can point that out and highlight those things to students and encourage them to practice. Um, so as we've already mentioned here, write and improve is a great tool. Um, and by practicing and by getting them to practice, they're also going to work on their reading skills. They're also going to work on their time management skills and you can give them writing prompts and you can make your own writing prompts because it's not about answering that question that might come up on the test. It's about having the skills and having the ability to be able to navigate whatever the response is, whatever the prompt is to help them with their writing skills. Um, so one point here, should essay types such as problem solutions require students' opinions? What do you think about this, Claudia? So it doesn't really require their opinion if they're discussing solutions and causes. The most important thing about that is for every uh, problem, there needs to be a solution or, you know, whatever the essay is. For every advantage, there needs to be a disadvantage. Um, they don't have to state their opinion in, in those exams. No. Um, is it? Like it's yeah, most commonly there will be a need to to state an opinion or to give an opinion at the end. But for those types of questions, um, no, I don't think so, because it's problem solution or it's one side, the other side. Again, it's asking you to discuss those points given, not necessarily mm -hmm. to give your points. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, though. All right. How can I better support my students writing? So if I'm working with students and I'm helping them with writing, how can I support them, Claudia? What should I do to support them better? Yeah, so as we've mentioned, just giving them clear instructions, um, breaking down what they need to do, because, 
you know, if we look at the band descriptors and we feel overwhelmed when we start out teaching IELTS, they definitely do. So explaining to them what is expected of them in that task is really important. So be really specific in your instructions. Um, and then planning, like teach them how to plan, help them create mind maps and um, how can they brainstorm ideas so you can give them brainstorming exercises. Like we've mentioned before, they'll come to you and say, how do I generate ideas? So help them plan, help them generate those ideas. Um, of course, teach them the structure. And it may even be you have to teach them paragraph by paragraph. So, okay, in the introduction, we have three lines or three sentences. In the first sentence, what should we have then? The second one and the third one, you know, if they need that kind of support that we need to give that to them. Like Daniel said, it's putting those blocks together. Um, again, provide feedback. So not, this is this is a good essay. Good, it's, it could, it's like a seven or 6.5. Why? Why exactly is it a 6.5? or seven, and how can we improve? What could we improve here? And then, and practice, give them lots of homework, lots of homework. They have to do, this is the practical side of um, IELTS. Not everything is done in your lesson with them. It should not be like that. And then um, encourage reading and writing. So reading and writing are interconnected skills. So teachers should encourage students to read extensively and then practice writing regularly every day um even if they have a journal that could just improve their general writing it it gets them into the routine of writing every single day and the thing with reading is it might help them generate ideas because many of the questions are based on social issues they're about social issues so get them to read um current affairs and get them to read about social issues as well Great point. Great point. Yeah, it, it, it's a good point. And, you know, regularly I'll ask students, OK, you know, on your lesson notes, can you write a summary of, of what you did in the lesson today just to help them practice mm. the summary writing skills and giving them articles? OK, I'm going to give you an article and I'm going to ask you to talk to me about the article. We can use it as a discussion connected to IELTS speaking questions, maybe create an, uh, an essay task based on that as well. So there's lots of ways you can do it. You can make it so it's not as, you know, regimented and as, you know, uh, formulaic you can try to add in a little bit more of that as well because it's still going to help them and benefit them um, so question how would you approach a student whose writing ability is extremely low great question so I think you just kind of touched on this Claudia start off from the very basics Mary so if their level is even band three or four like I've worked at mm. that level sometimes it's really really tricky and it takes a lot of time yeah. what I would say is just start off sentence by sentence step by step so maybe even get a band four or band five level and just say here's what what it is what we need to get to let's work backwards from that and let's work with them sentence by sentence so your first sentence you need to do this here's what it is here's what it means here are some words we can use to put this together so we can start building it slowly and we can work backwards using a model and we can help them put put everything in place now ultimately you know for IELTS generally if students taking IELTS they need I would say at a minimum a band five. So mm -hmm. you need to use that as a as a level eventually to work up to, like we said earlier, with, with higher levels. So break it down, go step by step, sentence by sentence, work with them, give them the vocabulary. So yeah, he needs seven, but he's at a three or four. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you're at a four now. Let's start off with five. Let's aim for a five and let's work through it step by step. Let's go through the steps. Once I'm happy and confident, however long it takes to get to that five, and we've worked on that, now we can move to a six. Okay, what are the differences? Okay, wider vocabulary. Let's look at vocabulary you might need for these questions so we can connect them in. Um, you know, in terms of structure, the structure should be the same. It's just going to be more developed. So we're giving a point and an example. So students can maybe start with a point and then an example. Okay, now you need to explain it. What's an explanation? What's a detail? What's a comment you can make? So you can build that up. We can give chunks, we can give phrases, we can give vocabulary, and then we can start to build and develop so that it goes from a short, simple response that's accurate, that's important, and then we just slowly add to it. So 
you know, use that same question and look at here's a band five response for that question. Here's a band six response for that question. Here's a band seven response for that question. And you start off with something small and you build that same response gradually over time so that they can see the steps. They can see the progression and then they have that. And once they're confident doing it with one, then you can build it up and expand it. So it's kind of a like a jigsaw kind of process you know, building it out and expanding it and then going from there. That's that's what I would suggest, which worked for me. Um, can you find response? You can find lots and lots of responses, Mary. Um, if you look on the video we provided on where to find resources, we've, we've listed a lot of different places where you can find resources. So you'll find that on your course, Mary. Claudia, do you have any other advice for this step? Yeah, so exactly what you said, just as easy as possible. Um, I've also worked with beginner students and it's sentence by sentence. And even with the um, letter, you know, giving them phrases that they can start off with. So they have four or three paragraphs and, okay, let me explain the situation. Then they know in that paragraph, they're explaining the situation. And that's, it's okay for them to memorize that little phrase that that's okay. So providing that framework for them and making it as easy as possible. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. So remember, if we take anything from reviewing today, remember the main challenges students face. We talked about this before. Time management. Okay. If I'm not an IELTS expert, I can still help them with time management. I can still help mm -hmm. them manage their time. How do we do this? Some students prefer to do task two first and then do task one last. But again, you can, there's different ways you can do this depending on the student. Using complex grammar. So we can definitely still teach grammar, even if we are not, you know, experts at teaching IELTS writing just yet, we can still teach complex grammar. Lack of vocabulary, same thing. We can give them the right vocabulary for the IELTS task. So connectors, linking words, ways to organize, you know, starting off at the beginning and giving examples, explanations, we can do that as well. Generating ideas. So you just said, Claudia, how do we help generate ideas? Give them tasks, give them readings, give them, you know, things that they can discuss based on questions that might come up, asking for opinions, asking for more information. Staying on topic is really important as well. Here's the band descriptors. We can look at them together. I, I generally look at them with my student together and we go over what it means and what it is and give examples. Paraphrasing, really important as well. Good, especially for the conclusion, for the last part of the writing. Can we paraphrase? Can we restate what we said? And then structure and flow. If I can teach you a full, a full section, full part, task two, writing response and you can remember that response and you can you can replicate it easily then that's a lot of the challenge done part one can i do it in three sections yes and then you spend some time on those and you can overcome these main challenges these are the biggest challenges so you can do this without having to be an expert with years and years of experience in teaching ielts so remember this and try to apply this um, go back through the slides go back through the recording and feel free to ask us if you have any questions